Welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for chapter 16. And if you remember back to our very first screencast for evolution, right before we started our work sample, we had looked at 16.1 and 16.2. And for those two um, particular sections, they focused primarily on Charles Darwin, which is the man that you see right here. And the idea was to get a little bit of history on Charles Darwin, um, kind of think about the evidence that he had collected in regards to sort of proving his case that evolution actually does exist. And so in 16.3, what we're going to do is, if you notice, he's quite a bit older by this time. And this is the point where he finally felt somewhat confident that he had enough evidence to prove his theory of evolution. Now, at the very beginning of our discussion about evolution, I had mentioned to the class that there needs to be a distinction between the concept of evolution and the process under which evolution actually occurs. And in regards to evolution itself, we know that evolution simply means a change over time, a long period of time. But the process that actually allows evolution to happen is known by a different name, and we call that natural selection. And so what we're going to do in 16.3 is we're going to look at natural selection and look at the three different, um, I guess you would say, components that must be met in order for natural selection to occur. And the very first one we're going to look at is one called the struggle for existence. And if you remember back after Darwin had looked at some of the um, readings that Malthus had produced, uh, Malthus was the scientist, who, or the economist, excuse me, that had actually put forth the idea that definitely humans were being born at a much faster rate than they were dying. And in order for them to be able to survive, there had to be a struggle. There had to be um, basically a way to sort of keep that population in check. And in his idea, in Malthus's idea, he felt that things like disease, famine, and war helped to keep the human population in check. And Darwin had looked at this and said, well, there must be something similar in nature. So in this case, for natural selection to occur, um, more individuals are going to be produced than can actually survive. And so when you have any animal produce, or I should say reproduce, um, the offspring, the numbers that they produce, needs to be quite a bit because there needs to be some sort of struggle between those offspring. They have to be able to compete for certain resources. And those resources would be things like food, living space, um, could be reproductive capabilities, in other words, their ability to reproduce or find mates. There's lots of different factors that might contribute to that competition. But you can't get natural selection occurring. You know, the idea that you want to select those that um, have a better chance at living in that environment unless there isn't some sort of competition. So there has to be a struggle in that population. Now, the second condition under which natural selection occurs is one called variation and adaptation. Now, of course, for there to be a struggle, there needs to be variation within the population. And, of course, those that are better suited to life in their environment than others are going to probably most likely be able to survive. Now, this variation that we notice has to be some sort of heritable characteristic, which means you need to be able to pass it on to your offspring. Now, um, basically, any heritable characteristic that's going to increase an organism's ability to survive, we're going to give that a special name, or we're going to call it an adaptation. Now, these adaptations can be structural, or they can be behavioral. And if you look over here on the right, you notice we have an example of an owl. Now, if you notice, this is a pretty unique bird because over many, many years, it's adapted to its environment in ways that allow it to be able to survive. If you notice, compared to other birds, owls have pretty significant eyes. If you notice, the eyes are typically much larger than they are in other birds because these animals tend to hunt at night, so it gives them better vision. They also have um, super sensitive ears, and so the ears you find in these animals compared to other birds, because of the type of prey that they do hunt, when you think about the voles, the mice, the rats, they actually the rodents that they actually have to hunt for food, um, those ears become very important. Um, if you notice down here towards the bottom, we have um, the talons that you would find on this type of animal. And of course, it is um, an adaptation that has actually allowed the owls to be able to grab their food pretty effectively. And so again, these can be structural or they could be behavioral. In other words, you could have an animal that is... Um, and say smarter than the rest of the population, but maybe they're able to reason a bit more and that sort of gives them an edge over the others within that population. 
Now the third condition under which natural selection occurs is going to be survival of the fittest. So kind of taking into account what we had looked at in one and two, we give this a special name. We call it fitness of that organism. So fitness is simply going to be how well an organism can survive and reproduce in its environment. And you have to take both of these together because even though it may be able to survive, it needs to be able to reproduce as well so we can pass those characteristics on to the next generation. Now when you talk about survival of the fittest, we're talking about those that actually have a very high fitness ranking. In other words, those are mo most likely going to be the ones that will be able to survive and reproduce. Then of course there's going to be those of course that have a low fitness ranking and those would be the members of the population that are not well suited to their environment and most likely those individuals are going to die and when they die of course they probably did not get the chance to reproduce. So survival of the fittest kind of makes sense because there's going to be some sort of struggle that's going to occur in the population which is going to cause others to compete with each other. There needs to be some variation in order for that competition to occur and then of course the main goal of most um, animals or most organisms in an environment is simply to survive and of course those as we said with the highest fitness are going to be the ones that survive. So in the previous slide we had looked at the conditions under which natural selection occurs, but again the idea of natural selection is basically just those organisms with certain variations that are best suited to their environment are going to survive and simply leave more offspring. So as we had said before, it's, it's going to occur when you have those three conditions. You need to have more individuals that are born that can actually survive. In other words, you have to have that struggle. There needs to be a natural heritable variation within that population. So again, looking back at what we had talked about in the previous um, slide, variation and adaptation are really important. And of course, as we said, there needs to be a high fitness. So only this, the fittest will actually survive out of that population. So if you look over here on the right, we have two examples. In this case, I believe this is a Katie did that you see in this picture. If you can see it in the picture, if you notice, this animal has adapted to its environment in terms of the way that it actually looks. Because if you notice, it's really hard to pick out the insect in this picture because over many, many, many generations, those that were able to blend in with their environment much, much better than others were probably the ones that were going to survive, and of course those would be the ones that would actually reproduce. And so they're going to pass those heritable characteristics onto their offspring. So over many, many years, they eventually become very, very similar to their environment in this case and are, are become very well camouflaged. Now down here towards the bottom, we have an example of a, a large moth. But if you notice, if you kind of back away from this moth a bit, you're going to notice that it kind of looks like it has some very large eyes. So if you have a predator that um, has come across this what is a moth might sort of mistake it for another animal. You know, an animal that would be much, much larger than what maybe that predator wants to take on. And so again, this is another way to sort of adapt to your environment because this one with a very large pattern or the very large eyes on its wings is probably more likely to survive than one that maybe has much smaller eyes on its wings or that pattern is much, much um, reduced than you would have in other members of the population. So again, these are the variations that are necessary in order for natural selection to occur. So as we had said, the process of natural selection is kind of the way that we um, sort of think about evolution occurring. Um, now Darwin had proposed that over many, many, many generations, these adaptations would eventually cause new species to evolve from those populations, which means when you think about a species, you typically think about a group of animals, plants, organisms in general, that can reproduce with each other. But if the changes become so significant that they can't actually reproduce with each other, that would be the case where we actually have a new species occur. So he also proposed that living species descended with modification. In other words, they descended from what we call a common ancestor. And so if you look down here towards the bottom, we had talked about something called the tree of life, all right? And back when I had you guys watch the video on Darwin, he had sort of demonstrated or kind of illustrated what he perceived as being the tree of life. He had talked about a trunk with many, many branches. And at the very bottom of that tree, this would be the ancient common ancestor to all of life on this planet. That was his, that was his idea. That was his sort of hypothesis. And so we basically call that descent with modification, which means that as these animals adapted to their environment, they changed a little bit, and that basically caused these different branches of that tree of life to occur. So according to the principle of common descent, 
all species, living and extinct, are descended from ancient common ancestors. And right here, you would see that ancient common ancestors. So again, even those ones that we see here, the dragonfly, the tree, the crayfish, all of those animals we still have around today are related to those that are no longer around. For example, like the dinosaur that you see right here. So again, this is sort of what Darwin had come up with, the whole idea that there has to be some sort of common link among all of life on this planet. So the final idea that actually helped to solidify the idea that evolution actually occurs was the idea of artificial selection. And the word you really want to pay attention to here is the word artificial. In other words, we have breeders out there, whether it's plants or animals, that know that organisms definitely do vary. And this variation can definitely be passed on to the offspring. So in artificial selection, nature will provide the variation and the human gets the opportunity to select those animals that they want to bring together to produce new offspring or it could be those plants as well and we want to bring those animals or plants together because we want to make sure we get the offspring that are the most useful to us. In other words, if you look up here to the upper right, you're going to notice we have definitely two varieties of dogs. And there was a time where somebody had looked at this variety of dog that you see right here. They found characteristics in a litter of puppies, and they felt that this would be a good characteristic to sort of make sure it got passed on to the offspring. So those puppies were selected out, and those were the puppies that were used um, for breeding. Um, same thing goes for this type of dog. If you look at a Chihuahua, for example, very small size, very compact. There were a few puppies that were maybe smaller than others, and the breeder definitely selected those puppies in their breeding program, and over a long period of time, we end up with a dog that looks like this. Now, Darwin felt that this variation in nature provided the raw materials for evolution. So in other words, this is something that actually happens in nature as well, only humans don't have the opportunity to make the selection. Now down here towards the bottom you can see different varieties of pigeons and these are pretty significant because actually Darwin was a breeder of pigeons and if you notice these three pigeons look very different from each other and they're different because breeders selected the characteristic that they wanted and they bred those birds together and they ended up with the outcome that you see here. So again humans were able to choose which animals or again like we said it could be plants as well to bring together to get the desired outcome. All right, so that's going to finish up our first screencast for Chapter 16. As always, it's really important for you to make sure that you complete your screencast notes before you come to class.